Welcome to part two of my buckwheat sourdough bread recipe. And I'm hoping that I can help you troubleshoot some common questions about baking gluten-free sourdough bread. So let's begin. Please watch until the end. I'll be comparing the two loaves baked in part one. Filming this video today for you that might be debating whether or not you are ready to bake a sourdough loaf and also prepare your first gluten-free sourdough starter. If you have any additional questions that I might not be answering in this video, please let me know in the comments below because I can answer them in the next video. I have here on my little counter some of my starters. This one I used this morning, but I just recently fed it, so it's not active yet. But if you keep watching right now, I will show you a clip of a really active starter, the one I used this morning in my bread recipe, and that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a bubbly starter. These two, I actually took them out last night, and I often get the question of, what do I do if there's like a liquid forming on top? But there's two different things you have to consider. Is this a brand new starter, or is this a starter that you've had and you've fed? You have to kind of I'll smell it. Like this one smells really, really good. So I would, I would have no problems stirring back in the surface liquid. If it smelled too vinegary or like not the best or most pleasant wild yeast starter smell, then I might opt to pour the surface liquid and then give it another good feeding. This one is nice. If I was to stir it, actually I will take a quick peek. It's too liquidy. So this one needs another feeding for sure. I would definitely feed this one again and then wait for it to get happy and lively. But this is definitely a, uh, a very good, it's actually my fruity starter. It's a really good starter of mine, but it does need another feeding right now. So sometimes when you're like, but I just fed it and then the water went right to the top and it kind of just fell flat, you know what? Just, you can give it time and or another feeding and give it more time and see what happens. You have to be patient with these wild yeast starters because they all have their own characteristics. This is another one of my popular ones. It always does well. It does have a different smell. In this case, there's no surface liquid, but it kind of looks like it would need another feeding before I would be able to use it because it's too compact. It's not lively enough. I just wanted to show you the differences, but in this instance, the one I used this morning, I just fed it not too long ago and I'm already seeing bubbles. So within the hour, that one potentially could be ready to use again. I often get the question of how do you know if it's like when you need to feed it more food or how do you store it? You know what? I have another video that can hopefully help you answer a lot of these questions. But as another example, because I am filming right now, this is my sorghum starter. I actually used some of this as well this morning, but then I'm left with a little bit less than a cup. I probably would give this another feeding before I returned it to the fridge. So I'm just going to quickly show you what it looks like. I'm not going to be baking with this one again, so once I feed it, I might leave it on the counter for a bit, but it's going to be going back to the fridge. So I'm going to just give it a few spoonfuls, generous spoonfuls, and that, once it's lively, will probably be like a cup. And then I'm going to give it a little bit of water. Sometimes I put too much water and my starters are kind of too liquidy, but you can either adjust it by adding more flour and or just leave it as is, but then you would have to adjust your bread recipe because if your starter's too runny, then it might affect your overall bread recipe, right? When you're feeding a starter, I don't necessarily measure, some people do. So equal amounts of water and flour by weight. So if you did 50 grams of water, you could do 50 grams of flour. I usually just do a few spoonfuls of flour and then I just eyeball it and add water until it's the right consistency. If it's too hard to stir, then you need more water. If it's too easy to stir, then you could potentially add more flour. So that is a good guideline. So for now, this one, I will just be keeping it on the counter for a bit and then it will be fine in the fridge for one to two weeks without worry. Enough about starters because like I said, I have another video that can hopefully help you troubleshoot some common questions about gluten-free starters. 
But if you have more questions, something that I might not have covered yet, just please ask in the comments below. And I also want to say that I'm really happy and proud of everyone that's reached out to me to ask me for proper substitutions for some of my recipes. When you replace one, you have to replace it with something that's comparable, which is why I'm working on a flower guide. It's not going to necessarily tell you which ones to replace with another one, but it will suggest to you what you could try. I will do my best to include as much information to cover all my bases, but it's not a magic formula, but it will hopefully help you improve your gluten-free and vegan baking with options that work. I will let you know when I'm ready to share that, but if, I, if it's ready by the time I post this video, I will definitely add a link to it so you can go get a copy of it and print it out and use it in your kitchen when you are, you know, short of an ingredient and you need to replace it with something else. So look for that. I'm going to mention my Facebook group quickly because I did in the first video, but again, if you have any gluten-free vegan baking questions, so that's baking without gluten, wheat, um, eggs or dairy, please, this group is super friendly. It doesn't cost anything to join, it's just a Facebook group, so it's a place where you can ask common questions or silly questions. At the beginning, we all have questions, so it's a great place to come and meet other bakers that like to bake similar recipes, so please ask to join. In my recipes, I always try to introduce various ingredients that will enhance the flavor, the nutrition value, and the texture of the loaves. Baking with gluten-free flour and seeds is different. There is a learning curve to master the right texture. All the ingredients listed in the recipe are gluten-free. Always make sure that flours or seeds you purchase are certified gluten-free and allergen-friendly if necessary. If you prefer to buy whole grains and seeds, you can transform them into a fine flour using a spice coffee grinder, a small blender, or grain mill. All my recipes either suggest a Dutch oven, I use my famous unbleached parchment paper pretty much all the time when I'm baking, especially bread. This is my baking stone. It's uh, pretty well used, but it's pretty much always in my oven underneath whatever I'm baking. It just kind of helps distribute the, the heat really well and I find it helps to add heat directly underneath your baked goods. So if you don't have one, I know I would like to invest in like either a baking steel or some baking tiles to cover the whole base of my oven um, grill or rack. But as a start, if you just have a pizza one, just that on its own is super helpful. You can see in the background, I've got my five quart Dutch oven. I've got the seven quart Dutch oven. Both are really, really good. And when you bake a loaf, it just helps to trap the heat and the steam. And you're not baking with a cover on the whole time, but it does help to uh, make gluten-free bread for sure. But it's not always necessary. And when I bake a loaf, Usually for the first day, I'll just take a clean towel and I will, honestly, I'll just place my loaf and I wrap it up, tuck in the, the edges and for the first day, this is kind of how I keep it. After the first day, if you haven't sliced your loaf yet, I would probably do so at that point. You could potentially keep it on the counter for another day, but it will at this point start to get dry kind of fast. You can store it in the refrigerator for up to five days, but as soon as you place it in the fridge, it's going to get kind of like dry and more hard, in which case you will have to toast your bread in order to have a satisfying texture, if that makes sense. If you don't have time to eat it all, then I would definitely freeze it. It will be really good for up to one month, and then it just kind of like over time up to the, you know, the second, third month, It'll still be okay, but not the best. After three months, I would totally, probably just get rid of it because it's not gonna be the freshest bread anymore, even if you toast it. And if you ask me what I store it in, you could just use a Ziploc bag, but if you're trying to reduce your plastic consumption is to just use a really nice glass container with a lid and you just put it in there and then you'll be all set. Last but not least, if I could help you troubleshoot a little bit more either my recipes and or other gluten-free baked recipes is people are asking is my oven too hot is my oven too low why did my bread rise but then it kind of like sank or why did it 
rise really well, but then the top crust separate it from the loaf itself. And then another option is it it's really, really compact and gummy at the bottom of your loaf, but then everything else kind of sort of looks okay. A lot of it has to do, in super all honesty, is bake in the middle rack, have a good heat, make sure to preheat your oven really, really well. In the beginning, I was always trying so hard to bake loaves in a bread pan, but for me, those were never my, my best bakes. I'm not sure if because I wasn't using a baking stone or I didn't have my Dutch oven, but as soon as I started using my Dutch oven, I, my bakes improved, and I've even placed a bread pan in my large Dutch oven with the cover on, and that really helped too. There is such a thing as, a, I think it's called a Pullman. It, it's a, a bread pan with a top. I haven't used that, but if you could get your hands on one, I think you can adjust to the size of your loaf accordingly. But it has a top, and maybe that would help to trap the steam at the beginning. And then there's, do you bake with steam? Do you not bake with steam? Well, today we're gonna bake with steam for one of them, and then the other one's gonna be in the Dutch oven. So we're gonna be able to experiment and see what works. Best. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you what did work. One of my Insta friends, but she said she loves the bread, but she finds the crust too hard. Well, yesterday I baked some rolls and I did reduce my oven temperature to 400 as opposed to my regular 450. And that was a yeasted recipe, mind you, it wasn't a sourdough. But I also brushed all my rolls with a mixture of hemp milk and olive oil just to kind of give it a little bit of more moisture. And it really helped to create a super good, moist, not too crispy roll. But for a sourdough today, again, I'm gonna try a couple different methods to see what yields a different kind of crust because some people love the crispy crust. I know I do, but for kids, I agree that kids tend to like you know, the softer, easier to chew crust. So once I have a few things that work really well that I can recommend to you, I will make sure to let you know where you can find those details because um, it is a, a question that's been asked before. So it's worth investigating a little bit further. My experiment yesterday was with hemp milk and it, I was kind of pleased with the outcome. So, and that's another recipe I will be sharing on another video if it's not already up. It is a a uh, yeasted, gluten-free and vegan roll recipe and I'm excited because it's really, really good. We'll be showing you the final bakes from the buckwheat sourdough recipe and I can't wait because it's one of my favorite recipes and it's one of the pop most popular recipes on Fresh Israel. So just to mention it again, this recipe is already up on my website but I will be updating it with some improvements and new pictures, new video, and some little tweaks to the recipe itself. So I hope you check it out, and I hope you share it with your friends. This is the first one. Can you see the inside? It looks really nice. The crumb is nice. It's not sticky, but it's, it's still a bit moist inside because it's still warm. And this one smells perfect. That's the part I like to eat. Fresh. I'm just going to move this to the side. I'm going to slice loaf number two. And this one is with the actual um, sorghum starter. Does that make a difference? Maybe. So the, the, cr the crust is crispy. This one is as nice. This one seems more springy. This one seems more dense. Again, it could be the ingredients, it could be the fact that the way it was baked. Wait a minute, I forgot the best part, the tasting of the bread. I need to try both. This is the one with the sorghum starter. I have a feeling I like this one better, but not sure why. This one has a crispy crust underneath, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I don't know, this is a tough call. They're both good. I think if I had to pick a favorite, it would be this one. Because in inside, it's nice and soft. But I actually do like the crispy crust underneath. But that's just me. Everyone's different, right? And the texture is really nice too. But I don't know if you remember, but this loaf is actually more wet as well. So that could make a difference. I think my vote is for 
this one. Even though it's practically the same recipe, I like the crumb and I like the crust the best. So, it's really good.